ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's online lecture of the British Institute for Libyan and Northern African Studies. I am delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Simona Troilo, who is an associate professor of contemporary history at the University of L'Aquila, Italy, where she has been based since 2015. She completed her PhD on art historical heritage and local identity in central Italy at the European University Institute in 2004. And before her current employment, she held various research positions at the universities of Venice, Padua, and Bologna. Her research interests include the use of antiquities in imperialism and colonialism, the construction of otherness, through the materials of the past and the relationship between materiality, visual elements, and discourses in colonialism. Simona has published extensively on the use of archaeological remains as part of colonial narratives, in particular, a very recent contribution in the 2022 issue of the journal Nuncius on visions of empire, the ruins of the Roman past in fascist Libya, and her latest book, Pietre d'Oltremare, Scavare, Conservare, Immaginare l'Impero, which was published by La Terza in 2021. Her talk tonight is titled Ruins of the Empire, Roman Antiquities in Fascist Libya. But just before we start, a quick reminder that there will be a Q&A session at the end of this talk. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function which you normally find at the bottom of your screen. So thank you very much. And Simona, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, for the presentation, and especially thank you for the invitation. So uh, what I would like to do in this talk is to analyze the transformation of the Roman ruins of Libya into an imperial heritage. I will therefore show how fascism used the traces of colonist Roman past from a dual perspective, that of the monumentalization and mutualization of the remains, and that of the construction of an imagery based on archaeology and aimed at defining different identities. I will try to answer three questions in particular. How did the regime construct a national imperial heritage with the traces of Libya's Roman past? What role did this heritage play for the regime? And did Roman antiquities interact with the context of conquest and domination? These questions refer here to a specific period of history, that of fascism and Italian colonialism, but actually they could also be extended to other contexts in which colonialism and more generally imperialism made use of archeology. span Actually, what I would like to propose here is a research perspective that inquires antiquities in order to understand the nature of empires and the cultural matrix of colonialism. Well, as is well known, fascists paid great attention to the remains of the Roman past, which since the mid 1920s were celebrated and monumentalized in both Italy and Libya. As Mussolini wrote, the Roman ruins were the millenary monuments that make our history, the evidence of the glorious past that imprinted its glory on the present. The Roman ruins showed how the imperial destiny of fascism was already inscribed in the past and how the present was nothing but the outcome of the centuries old history of the Italic race. Thanks to this idea, Archaeological remains were restored and monumentalized all over the peninsula, starting with the capital. Within a few years, in Rome, the imperial forums, the Theater of Marcellus, the Mausoleum of Augustus, the Arapaches, among others, were isolated in their grandeur, becoming important symbols of the fascist historical imagery. In Libya, two antiquities were at the center of the regime's attention. Here, they had a crucial role both in legitimizing fascist expansionist ambitions and in consolidating the metropole-colonial relationship. 
The colonial Roman remains demonstrated at one hand the existence of a deep bond between Italy and its fourth shore. At the other hand, Italy's right to control this region of Africa. Actually, this right had already been claimed before fascism when the war against the Ottoman Empire in 1112 and the subsequent in 1911 and 1912 and the subsequent annexation of Libya had been culturally legitimized by the very myth of Rome. As the then supporters of the colonial enterprise claimed, Italy was not going, but rather, but rather going back to its ancient colony, following in the footsteps of the empire. The Italian soldiers, as you can see in this image by uh, Fortunato Matania, were nothing more than Rome's new legionaries resurrecting in Libya to regain what was rightfully theirs, their own legacy. This legacy included the remains of buildings and artifacts scattered through the territory, the funeral monuments at Girza, the Ein Zara mosaic, the Venus of Cyrene, were exploited by war propaganda and transformed into symbols of Italian right over Libya. The ideological use of these materials produced two outcomes. First, the start of the patrimonialization and second, the beginning of their massive exploitation in terms of identity. However, it was with fascism that these two processes assumed absolute centrality in colonial policy, which from the mid 1920s focused on the ruins in order to assert the regime power, strengthen the Italians bond with their colony and make the Italians themselves aware of their belonging to a millenary race. Roman antiquities now became a tool for the creation of a new Mediterranean order and for the shaping of an imperial Italianness. Then, while in Italy, as we said, the regime pursued the monumentalization of Romanity, something similar happened in Libya. From the mid 1920s, the regime increased the resources dedicated to archaeology reinforced the superintendency of Tripolitania and Cyrenaica, merging them even eventually into a single superintendency of Libya, created the archaeological sites of Leptismania, Cyrene, and Sabrata, founded new museums in Tripoli and Benghazi, and new collections at the excavations. In other words, the regime patrimonialized and musealized colonial antiquities transforming them into imperial heritage. This process had not only material implication, but also, and above all, a cultural and symbolic one, as antiquity became an important theme in the consensus building machine. Archaeology actually bowed to the propaganda that through it celebrated the fascist revolution, the power of the new man, the skill of the Italian race, to rule as Rome had ruled. The propagandistic use of archaeology led to a specific result. For the first time, antiquities were addressed to the masses through a process of popularization and spectacularization that took place at various levels. First of all, the visual level. Ruins and artifacts of Libya were dematerialized and circulated in the form of images thanks to various communicative devices. Postcards like these, stamps, advertising materials, photographs on press, and photographs on portfolio album disseminated antiquities in the visual economy of colonialism. They also became a constant presence in the illustrated magazines of the time the Rivista Illustrata del Popolo d'Italia, l'Illustrazione Italiana, Le Vie d'Italia, Libia, to name but the most important, became spaces in which to talk about and above all to show the colonial ruins, which were photographed and offered to an even wider public. The visual text in these periodicals narrated the imperial destiny of Rome and the civilized role of the Eternal City. 
they also narrated the great technical skills of the regime, which wrested the ruins from the desert sand and monumentalized them thanks to scientifically advanced knowledge. The images of the remains display their grandeur and solemnity, while the numbers and figures of the successes achieved by the archaeologists recalled the primacy of the Italian race. Romanity unfolded before the eyes of the Italians, allowing them to familiarize themselves with the grammar of ruins that the visual dimension made even more effective. The dissemination of Libyan antiquities also passed through another visual device, such as the films by the Instituto Luce, which devoted significant space to colonial heritage since its foundation. The newsreels and documentaries produced by the Institute had a specific aim of educating the masses to see the greatness of the regime. In this case, it was a unique pedagogical work that extolled the Roman colonial past. Between the mid-1920s and the late 1930s, Lucia films celebrated the miracle of Romanity in the colony and the Roman genius expressed in the constructions of roads, aqueducts, and other infrastructures that had, been, that had made the region prosperous in the past. These films did not just celebrate Libya alone, but link the colony to other Mediterranean countries precisely through Romanity. Films like this, Il Ritorno di Roma, 1926, often refer to Roman ruins in Tunisia, Algeria, Syria, showing the extension of imperial rule and evoking the ambitions of fascists toward a wider international context. What audiences could learn from these films was not only the magnificent legacy of the Roman Empire, but also the regime's ability to spread these achievements through the technological innovations of the new communication system. Through the antiquities of Libya, that is, fascists celebrated again not only the past, but also its own present of modernity. Now, what exactly did these visual texts do? What did the photographs disseminated by the press and the films shown in cinema produce? They constructed a visual atlas of Romanity, which from Rome through Libya extended to infinity, reinforcing the sense of belonging to a powerful race. Libya's antiquities had reformulate through Romanness, Italianness. That means a national identity conceived in the terms of empire. African ruins were not only patrimonialized and musealized, but also mediatized, and this mediatization was intended to indoctrinate the viewer, prompting them to internalize specific messages and visions of history. In this powerful work of patriotic pedagogy, visual texts actually didn't act alone, but together with another important instruments of imagery creation, such as the direct experience of ruins. Actually, the regime considered it a priority for Italians to learn about their colony and the fascist civilization project. It considered, therefore, a national duty for them to travel to Libya to admire the progress of their colonization. Here, the Italians should have recognized the signs of their millenary nature of their home race. In front of the remains of temple, of civil buildings, roads, and the many other infrastructures inherited from Rome, they should have felt the pride of belonging to a race that had conquered the world and was ready to rebuild the empire. Pride and self-awareness should have been derived from the past and projected onto a future that was unquestionably perceived in glorious terms. Who then were the Italian visitors to Libya's Roman antiquities? How did they experience the Roman remains? At the beginning, it was mainly tourists who came to the colony on trips organized by the Touring Club Italiano or Dante Alighieri Society or other amateur archeological associations. For them, visiting Roman antiquities, monuments and museums represented the heart of the holiday which also included tours of the regime's agricultural concessions 
and trips to picturesque villages in the island. However, among the so-called pilgrims of beauty who visited Leptismania, Sirene, and Sabrata, there were also Balilla boys, avant-gardists, university students, and representatives of the economic and commercial sector who were sent to the fourth shore on cruises organized by the fascist organization Dopo Lavoro or other institutions co controlled by the state. Between 1924 and 1934, the colony welcomed thousands of traders, entrepreneurs, colonial studies enthusiasts, university students, young fascist women, teachers, who left Italy to live in Libya a unique experience. Whatever category or social class they belonged to, the Italian visits in the colony were addressed with an increasingly monotonous rhetoric, centered on the themes of lineage, race, spirit of fathers, and the intimately imperial nation. This rhetoric reinforced the archaeological imagery that visitors were already endowed with before they arrived in the colony, thanks to the propaganda or to the school indoctrination. Monumentalism and the idea of history as spectacle already permeated their cult of Romanità, which was now put to the test in the tour of the ruins. This tour was developed down to the smallest detail. The archaeological site was a stage on which the power and modernity of fascism were displayed and its visitors, the unwitting actors in a performance that was once again described, photographed, filmed, and disseminated through the media. The participants' experience of visiting the antiquities was thus extended to the inhabitants of the metropole, who received a wealth of written and visual texts recounting the two that had taken place at the celebrated sites. This allowed for a direct experience and an indirect mediated one capable of reaching the minds and the eyes of people across the sea. Bringing Italian to visit the ruin then had the dual aims of instilling a widespread colonial consciousness and reinforcing support for the regime's colonization project. However, another subject was at the center of the same kind of visit the settler, who had been transplanted to Libya from the late 1920s onward. As both propaganda and archaeologists affirmed, visiting the ruins served not merely to attract, I quote, a current of sympathy for the colonists from the metropolitan public, but also to help Italians to settle into their new home. Libya had to enter the earths of its new inhabitants, even through antiquities, which will have given them an important symbolic orientation for the future. Indeed, the Roman materials disclose not only the settlers belonging to a colonizing race, but also their innate technological expertise to be dust off in their genetic heritage. The remains of buildings, agricultural estates, and public infrastructures, especially roads and aqueducts, which they had inherited from their Roman ancestors were nothing more than signs of what they too could have produced, restoring the empire's ancient province to a place of prosperity. Where the settlers visiting the antiquities? They were students from local schools and workers organized by the regime, but also ordinary people spending a holiday in the area. Somewhere between a moment of leisure and an act of fate, the cultural consumption of antiquities gave the so-called Italians of Africa an opportunity to establish a privileged bond with the territory. Moreover, it allowed them to ideally overcome the cultural differences stemming from their different regional origins in the name of an Italianness that was firmly anchored to the past. Again, their consumption of the ruins was immortalized and popularized, especially when it took place during special events organized by the regime. For instance, like you, as you can see in this image, the gathering of uh, Tripoli students under the arch of Marco Aurelius for an 
immersion into Romanness or the impressive excursion of workers that was organized by Dopolavoro in Sabrata to celebrate the annual anniversary of the birth of Rome in the year of the stipulation of the Lateran Pax in 1929. The images of this gathering showed for the first time an altar among the Roman ruins at which a mass was celebrated in the name of the union of religion in homeland and the true greatness of our race. Events like these were widely mediatized because of their emblematic value and with the aim of highlighting the regime's political evolution. For the same reasons, other special visits were largely publicized, for instance, those of the members of the royal family, high state officials, ministers, and above all, Mussolini, who visited Libya and its archaeological sites for the first time in 1926 and then in 1937, the year after the proclamation of the empire. As propaganda narrated, Mussolini went to the colony to pay homage to the spirits of the fathers. In the presence of the ruins, he staged a ritual that had, a, that had the form of a devotional act and that reconnected Italianness with Romanness, transforming the colony into the place that best reflected the themes of imperial identity. Now, tourists, ordinary people organized by the regime, settlers, high state officials, Mussolini, there were that they were the subjects that animated the excavation scene during the fascist period. But alongside them, there were others equally important for understanding the political value of antiquities, foreign travelers. They were part of a transnational phenomenon, that of archeological tourism, which grew considerable between the two world wars, when the widespread interest in antiquities developed in Europe among social classes who could make the most of their free time and devoted to travel and discovery. Educated and cosmopolitan tourists began to cross the Mediterranean thanks to new maritime connections, new hotel networks, and new leisure facilities created in many Mediterranean cities. For these travelers, fascist Libya was an attractive destination equal to Palmyra, Baalbek, and the Egyptian pyramids. In Libya, they could not only admire the splendor of the archaeological site, but also compare the work done by the Italians with that carried out by other colonial administrations in North Africa, for example, the French. Obviously, the regime's attention to this implicit comparison was considerable, and efforts were made to make the foreign's contact with the ruins memorable. Open air theater performances, guided tours among the ruins combined with uh, desert excursions, even ice cream vans among the sand dunes of the sites ensured a unique and, as the propaganda claimed, unforgettable experience, demonstrating again the primers of Italian science and the strength of the regime. In this case, too, the visits were mediatized in order to enrich the vision of the colonial power. From the end of the 1920s, the direct and virtual experience of ruins was thus part of an identity policy used to reinforce the regime and the Italian power in the Mare Nostrum. Travelers and settlers represented the heterogeneous humanity that consumed and populated the place of Romanness in Libya. These people, both Italians and foreigners, shared a distinctive trait, whiteness. The consumers of Libyan antiquities were white men and women who enjoyed exclusively the spectacle of history. And this spectacle allowed them to confirm their privileged position in the imperial hierarchies. If Italians found in the past the confirmation of their own identity, foreigner visitors so reflected in the past their image as exponents of a rich and civilized world. The Italian national imperial heritage, constructed through specific institutions, narratives, and practices, 
and made functional to the ideological reasons of the regime made the existence of a wide dominating universe explicit. In doing so, however, Italian colonial heritage also did something else. It excluded from the use of the remains and the narrative of cultural belonging other subjects, those on whom colonization violently fell. By becoming Italian, fascist and white, the ruins of empire further legitimized the power relationship between colonizer and colonized, reinforcing the colonial situation and the imbalance and asymmetries that it promoted. To better understand this aspect, we must broaden the analysis to the relationship between archaeology and colonial rule, and more specifically to the relationship between the construction of imperial heritage and the subjugation of the colony. As is known, the total control of Libya was achieved in the early 1930s with an exercise of violence that led to mass deportations, concentration camps, and brutal repression. The so-called pacification of Libya occurred hand by hand with the excavation campaigns and control over the colony was also achieved through the liberation and cleansing of the areas where the archeological finds were located. People were removed from there and these spaces were fenced off and turned into white destinations in the name not only of the myth of Rome, but also of an exercise of power that tended towards totality. This kind of expropriation was pushed by archeologists as a way to assert Italy, not only scientifically, but also politically. As the archeologist Carlo Anti wrote, I quote, archeology span was not an end in itself. It was not mere erudite research, but was high political war that in Libya could contribute to the hard struggle for the subjugation of the natives. Colonial archaeology was indeed pervaded by a strong sense of mission. It was meant to help reinforce the ideal bond with the ancestors, consolidating the control of the country and affirming the power of Mussolini's Italy. The strong politicization of the discipline transformed excavations, restorations, and monumentalizations in powerful tools of ejection and exclusion. This transformation has actually already begun with the annexation of the colony and the first restoration work carried out in Tripoli from 1912. Here, for example, the restoration of the Arch of Marco Aurelius led to the demolition of the houses and workshops that had encompassed it and the expulsion of its inhabitants from the area. The arch was fenced off, removed from the special and social practices of the place and transformed into the symbol of Italian success in the Mediterranean. This transformation and resemantization changed its nature the arch became a place of aesthetic contemplation for curious and traveling Italians. It also became a monument in which a new generation of settlers, as the school children I have shown you before, could recognize the value of their own lineage. Through Romanes, this monument was transformed into an icon of Italianness that erased from the scene the others excluded from the discourse of belonging. Always in Tripoli, from, 19, from the 1920s onwards, urban excavation redefined the residential and commercial fabric of various neighborhoods, laying the foundations for tourist routes that run between different points in the city. Here too, space changed according to wishes and plans of the colonizer, who imposed its own visions and its prominent presence. It was nonetheless with the construction of the archaeological sites that the process of cleansing and liberation reached the peak because the monumentalization and patrimonialization of the ruins meant the total removal of those who lived in the areas. The people who lived in the site of Sirene, for instance, were removed 
through a harsh action of the vice governor Rodolfo Graziani, who after defeating the resistance, ordered the end of what he considered a barbarian presence. The same fate befell the Tismanian Sabrata, which from 1936 became a prominent symbol of the regime. The entrenched camps of the excavations, I use the words of the archaeologist Luigi Bernier, arose at the same time as the internment and concentration camps in which the recalcitrant rebels were looked up. In Apollonia, an archaeological site and an internment camp were built simultaneously. These camps, moreover, took the form of the Roman castrum, which inspired the way in which the logistics of rebel internment were organized. Overall, the excavations represented another phase of the territorial control. While the regime crushed the resistance and oppressed the population, archaeology domesticated the territory and sanitized the archaeological area of negative elements. What we might call a military, cultural, and symbolic participation found its reason not only in the political theme of domination, but also in that of the irrelevance of the local population to Latin civilization. The others, the inhabitants of the territory, were infer inferiorized with respect to the greatness of Latin civilization and considered not only as an obstacle to monumentalization, but also as intruders with respect to the context recreated by the Italians. This figure, the figure of the intruder, emerges from the press, from archive documents produced by archaeologists and superintendencies, from correspondence between institutions involved in the antiquities management. Monumentalized for the white subjects, the ruins were precluded to others because these others had little to do with the real Libya. This theme soon became central to the discourse of imperial heritage. In 1931, the Rivista Illustrata del Popolo d'Italia wrote, for example, it is hard to understand how destiny has allowed marauders of the Berber race to roam among these monuments of different civilizations, wandering on camels without direction. They are the last ghost of the Senusso, left as bogeymen on the political map of the African cosmos. These marauders, who for generations have walked over bordered cities, ignoring their hidden artistic treasures, were now to disappear to make a way for the solemnity and magniloquence of, the, uh, uh, of an exclusive Romanity. The following year, the same magazine wrote how, I quote, the natics with their rugged grazing represented parasites of the past, still present in a scenario to be reserved only for the crusaders of beauty. These parasites are also mentioned in the documents produced by the superintendents and archaeologists who aim to eliminate the dunk hill of the natives in order to restore the decorum and beauty to the finds. As a superintendent Giacomo Caputo writes, the Bedouin pests that lurked in the ruins were to be removed and replaced with flower pots. In reality, the intruder was not entirely expelled from the landscape of ruins, but when he was reintegrated into it, it was in the form of subalternity and exploitation. In fact, the archaeological excavations were carried out by local labor force, that means by workers impo impoverished by the suppression of many productive activities, and more generally, by mass deportations ordered by the regime to break the ties between communities and anti-colonial resistance. The excavations also exploited the forced labor of prisoners, which grew out of all proportion with the establishment of the special courts for crimes committed against the Italians. Invisible in the identity discourse of the ruins, these subjects reappeared there in the form of subjugated workers, as the visual texts also show. 
as many photographs and films by the Instituto Lucio display, the archaeological site often became a space where the power relations between colonizers and colonized were clarified. Workers were portrayed carrying out their activities under the watchful eye of the archaeologists, or they were immortalized posing in front of ruins as gouges to determine their sites. Sometimes they were placed in the background of scenes that had others as the real protagonists, as in this photo, which immortalizes the governor, to, the governor of Tripolitania, Giuseppe Volpi, while accompanying his guest to visit the site of Leptis. In the background, you can see the prisoner's place at the edge of the scene. The visual dimension highlighted once again the centrality of the colonizers, their ability to resurrect the, under, the past, the modernity of their means, the rationalities of their actions. The same visual dimension underlined the overwhelming distance between intellectual and manual labor and the relationship between rulers and subjugated. The archaeologist's ability to unearth the true about the past marked boundaries and distinctions, constructing an inferior and subordinate otherness excluded from the new life of the colony. Now, in conclusion, the ruins of Libya and their transformation into national imperial heritage help us to understand many aspects of fascist colonial rule. First, the importance the regime reserved for Roman remains, not only in Italy, but also in the colony. Secondly, the role played by these remains in redefining national identity and more generally Italianness. Thirdly, and most interestingly, the role that archaeology played in defining boundaries and identifying an inferior otherness. What I, want, what I want to suggest with my analysis of colonialism through archaeology is the strong role of materiality in shaping power relations. As we have seen, the rediscovery of the Roman past and the construction of the imperial heritage was a process of meaning making of the history made possible by several factors. New systems of mass communication, new techniques of vision, new social practices made possible the elaboration of an historical imagery center on African Romanity. However, it was the remains of Libya that ensured the possibility of developing this imagery and the various identification process it enabled. The same remains allowed the colonial situation to be further delineated, reinforcing imbalances and asymmetries and consolidated power relations. From this point of view, from this point of view, the Italian case shed important light on the role of archaeology and the implication that the ruins of the past can have in a political and social dynamics in a country like Libya and the moment of history like this, but other in other contexts and in other country. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Simona, for this fascinating talk and the very intriguing relationship between archaeology, colonialism, and especially tourism, how this was exploited as part of the propaganda of the fascist regime. Um, so now we've got time for questions. If anyone has any question, please type your question in the Q&A box, and then I will read it to uh, Simona. Um, I see that we've got, uh, well, it's one comment from John Mason, who points out a recent publication, just in case uh, you're interested, um, Hamida Ali Abdullatif's book, Genocide in Libya, Shar, A Hidden Colonial History, which was published by Routledge in 2021. Uh, so surely this will contain uh, important information on the topic. And then I see we've got uh, one question from Graham Barker. 
um, who is asking, was there any pushback to the Italian colonial heritage agenda from fascist opponents like Gramsci and Levy? Sorry, uh, Nicola, I, I could Oh, sorry, hear. yes, yeah. I, I'll read it again, <laughs> don't worry. So um, Graham is asking if there was any pushback to the Italian colonial heritage agenda from fascist opponents such as Gramsci or Levy at the time. Uh, it's an excellent question and I really don't know how to reply. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, I really have to think about this, but mm. perhaps we, we, we could... Uh, um, we can try with other um, questions and then collect our questions and then, uh, and then put together all these things. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, um, I, 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 uh, yes, I prefer this. <laughs> That's fine, yeah. Um, so I see that there is just one more question from Stephanie yeah. Grant. Um, so she's asking if any of the archaeologists actually rejected this approach to well, the colonial archaeology of Libya at the time when mm. this was going on, at the time of the excavation? Well, archaeologists were uh, generally prone to the regime, so uh, mm. very few of them have the uh, the courage, the possibility, the will to uh, contrast uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this idea of creating an imperial heritage with these, um, these instruments and with these... Uh, ideological uh, uh, frame but uh, they were they were really really uh, few and uh, i think it's mm. really interesting to note that the most of these archaeologies uh, with the end of the regime were inserted in the um, heritage administration of the uh, republican italy and um, um, it could be very interesting to explore um, which continuities uh, there are in this uh, transplantation, in this insertion, if if the ideological uh, way of consider archaeology uh, was uh, transplanted in this uh, new uh, field, in this new area, but uh, all these uh, is uh, an unexplored field of research. But mm -hmm. I think that uh, um, interrogating interrogating this question and. Uh, uh, trying to understand uh, in, in in which way this uh, uh, insertion happened could be uh, very fruitful for um, understanding the the real idea archaeologists uh, uh, transplanted in uh, the Italian heritage machine, and also the continuities between fascist and post-fascist Italy. That uh, mm. uh, you know Absolutely. there are, there are a, a lot of continuities, and we have a, a colonial archive a very very interesting to explore yeah definitely yes um i see that graham also has a question again whether the uh, agenda of the italian colonial heritage incorporated as well prehistoric rock art no or what so the... no definitely not no yeah. the interest was uh, uh, the Roman past and everything that was out of this field was completely marginalized we have right. an interest by Italians for uh, uh, prehistory uh, in after the the, the crash of the regime, in, uh, uh, when the Italians uh, um, uh, excavated in Libya uh, and uh, dedicated the research to prehistory. But we are in, uh, in the fifties, so mm -hmm. in, a, in a period yeah. very very late in respect of this period. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think this is a very important point because obviously. When you've got something like Tripolitania, the main sites of Tripolitania, where the remains of the Roman imperial yes. period are pretty obvious in front yes. of you. Yes. And I was wondering when you were talking about tourism. So yes. tourism was not just restricted to Tripolitania, but also involved Cyrenaica and yes. Cyrene as well. Yes. So, well, the city of Cyrene was probably a bit more problematic to present to yes. the masses because of the Greek heritage. Everything yes. is looks pretty much Greek when you go yes. to Cyrene. So do you know how this was perceived, whether there was tourism was organized in a different way when people visited the site of Cyrene in order to make it fit within the propaganda of the regime? Well, the theme in this um, in, in this context was the, um, the the skills of archaeologists and of Italian science to uh, 
uh, to rediscover the past. So um, the, the power of the regime in this case was uh, a power that was derived by the, uh, the science, the Italian science uh, in uh, uh, the archeology span uh, succeed in, uh, um, in doing what others uh, couldn't do in, uh, in Northern Africa. And the archeological site of Serene was a, a magnificent, uh, a place uh, where the tourists uh, could be directed by the regime. So in this case, right. uh, uh, there, there was no reference to the, um, the Greek past, but uh, to the magnificent, uh, magnificence of the regime and the scientific skills of uh, um, Italian fascist archaeologists. I see. Oh, oh, very neat way to go around the problem. Yes, yes <laughs> definitely, definitely. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Um, I see David Atkinson is asking a question, which is something I was also thinking about when you were giving your presentation. If you can say something about the size and scale of it, the Italian tourist trips to Libya. So whether these were elite, wealthy tourists, or also trips uh, subsidized at more, af uh, more affordable prices. And how many people would have been, how widespread would have been well, uh, we have so. Um, well, it's an interesting question. We have sources um, from the regime organizations. Mm. So uh, <laughs> when when I when I I, do, I did my research, I uh, I could compare these sources, but they were produced exclusively by the regime, by the touristic uh, organization, by the regime. So it's very hard to uh, uh, to deeply understand which, which was propaganda and which was the reality of this uh, uh, phenomenon. But we can say that uh, um, tourists were um, uh, really numerous in Libya. And we can, uh, from this comparison, com we can realize that uh, uh, the most of them are generally educated uh, uh, cosmopolitan tourists and travelers uh, uh, who uh, make their trips autonomously or uh, with the Touring Club Italiano uh, mm -hmm. and other local and national archaeological associations. Um, middle classes and lower classes were uh, brought to Libya uh, by the Dopo Lavoro and by other fascist uh, organisms which organized these trips in order to uh, create this uh, new type of uh, travel that was a pilgrim to ruins. But uh, they are subjects that are organized by the regime. Um, it's also interesting to know that uh, uh, the settlers who visited the archaeological sites uh, were settlers also uh, coming from uh, lower social classes. And um, I found a lot of uh, um, uh, visual text, especially photographs in uh, um, family archives or in mm -hmm. family albums. Mm -hmm. And the trip to the sites, to the archaeological sites, was a uh, was a way to um, to to uh, to practice uh, um, um, a kind of uh, uh, holiday trip, and it was. Um, um, a, a very uh, spread practices, a very spread activities that of uh, going in these places uh, and uh, only to, to, to pass their uh, a daily trip. I see. Very interesting. Yes, uh, for, um, private albums are, uh, photograph albums are very interesting in this point of view. Yes, definitely, absolutely. Yeah. Major source of information. Yeah. Uh, so now we've got a question from David Stone, who um, says, thank you for a very interesting talk, and I agree with that, and um, he's wondering whether there are any connections between fascist projects in Italy, within mm -hmm. Italy, and those in Libya. So if the same archaeologists were working in both places, or the same officials were overseeing the work in both places at the time. Archaeologists working in Libya were the same archaeologists that worked in Italy because they uh, spend their time in Libya uh, for uh, uh, three or four months uh, a year. So they 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 come and they come and go uh, from from Italy and they generally work in the uh, superintendents uh, Italian superintendents. Mm -hmm. 
um, uh, it's also interesting that uh, a lot of them uh, were integrated after the regime in uh, Italian universities as archaeologists and as professor of uh, uh, Storia Romana. And uh, this is a very, this is a field um, that should be uh, investigated in order to understand the continuities between uh, fascist and post-fascist Italy. And yeah. um, it's also true that uh, uh, for archaeologists, Libya was uh, um, a space uh, where um, practice uh, a, a very experimental archaeology. Uh, things that yes. uh, was not possible to do in Italy, archaeology uh, could do in this context. And it, it's also true that in Libya, um, the archaeological laws um, permitted archaeologists to uh, to make things that in Italy was completely um, uh, yeah, unusual. Be because, yes, because uh, uh, in Libya, for instance, the law uh, permitted... Um, to consider um, property of the state, everything that was uh, unhurted. Uh, the right. Italian law, the Italian archaeological law in this moment in Italy didn't permit this. Yeah. So in Libya, there was um, a, a freedom that archaeologists could sure. live that they don't have in Italy. I see, obviously, which made a major difference, of course. Yes. And I think also the fact that tourism was so connected to archaeology, we can clearly see the effect of that because as soon as many of those buildings were excavated and pretty much at the same time, they were being restored as yes. well. Yes. Precisely yes. because I think tourism was one of the main goals yes. in order to have those sites as accessible as possible, as quickly as possible. Yes, the case of Sabrata is quite yeah. clear in this sense. No, there was a big, uh, the regime uh, realized that Libya was not so um, rich in uh, economic, uh, in, from the economic point of view. And mm. so it, uh, um, it developed these uh, touristic vocations and archaeology was used in order to to increase the economy of the the growth the economical growth of the colony it became the um, an important source for the uh, finance of the of the libyan economy yeah absolutely um um i will now quickly go to a question by Susan Abugrara, which is still related uh, to archaeology. So she's saying that by reading some documents in Libya's historical archive, it was interesting to see that those employees of the Sovrintendenza that continued working in Libya during the British protectorate continued working using the same approach to Roman antiquities until they retired eventually in the 1950s. Yes, it's true. The Romanocentric <laughs> paradigm was uh, hmm. uh, was used also um, after the uh, the break of uh, fascism, the fascist regime, and uh, all the the archaeologists uh, who uh, continue to excavate uh, in Libya had in mind these uh, uh, Romanocentric paradigms. It's also true that uh, uh, when they come back to Italy, uh, they in, they continue to uh, to to have a, a nostalgic approach to <laughs> the work that they uh, developed in Libya, and it's also very interesting in order to understand uh, which was the relationship between Libya and uh, Italy, uh, for instance, in the 1950s or in 19 yeah. uh, or, or before the um, the arriving of um, uh, Gaddafi. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Speaking of which, there is a question which goes slightly uh, beyond uh, the topic of the talk, but it's still related by mm -hmm. Abdul Rauf Khalifa, who's wondering about the compensation for the mm -hmm. war, because he says what people were hearing during the Gaddafi regime is that Libyans would have been compensated uh, because of the fascist war. So uh, what happened in that sense? Yes, the, 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 it's a big question, that's of compensation. But uh, mm. And it's very interesting that in the Italian public debate, the question of compensation related to antiquities uh, came up in, uh, uh, the, in uh, 2000 when um, there was the discussion of the restitutions of uh, uh, archaeological yeah. uh, uh, artifacts looted by Italians and transferred in Italy. 
and uh, there was um, uh, in the 2000 there were two big restitutions the the restitution of the venus of serene that you have seen in the image yep. and the yep. restitution of the sale um, of axum to uh, ethiopia and yes. when uh, there was the restitutions of the venus of serene this restitution was uh, uh, extremely debated because uh, mm -hmm. the mm, the Italians largely want, uh, didn't want to the, the return of the, the sculpture. And um, in, the, in the public debate, uh, one of the themes that was really exploited was that, was that of the compensation, but in a very uh, interesting way. Uh, many uh, pundits or uh, intellectuals uh, or uh, uh, journalists, uh, um, especially from the uh, right or conservative political areas, um, sustain that um, the Venus of Serene should should uh, should stay in Italy uh, because uh, um, it uh, would be the compensation for the works that uh, Italians and archaeologists made in Libya. So uh, it, it's a it's a court of circuit of, of the discourse yeah. because uh, uh, the question uh, um, was not the compensation that Italians uh, should give to Libya, but uh, the Venus could be the compensation for by Libya from uh, for the the work the good work the good job that Italians have made in uh, his own colonies. Right. <laughs> and it's very interesting. In, in, interesting the term of the colonial archive. Yes, yeah, yes, of course, of course. Um, I see now we've got one question from Barbara Spadaro. She says again, thank you very much for this fascinating lecture. She's wondering whether you have explored or if you're planning to explore a Libyan understanding of Italian archaeology in Libya. Mm -hmm. And if so, through which sources? Well, I would like very much to explore these topics, uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to go to, I've never been in Libya, and I know that in Libya, the archive in Tripoli, it's a really uh, extraordinary uh, archive, but I, um, I, I think that uh, it could be a good approach to start from this kind of documentation, mm -hmm. but I've not the possibility to come to go there until now. I think that it could be also very interesting to explore the uh, the Libyan attitude towards Romanities, um, starting, for example, from um, the, the, the Libyan community in Italy. And uh, mm -hmm. I, it would be extremely interesting to uh, to to explore, for instance, the um, the way in which they um, um, the the view the public debate on restitution of the Venus because yeah. uh, uh, it was sure. extremely there there was um, there were uh, strong debate. positions and uh, it would be very interesting to to investigate how they consider this debate and how they they see that yeah absolutely that would be very interesting yeah. to investigate yes uh, I mean so related to this, not specifically to the Libyan community in Italy, but to the Libyan community in Libya, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to flag up our next uh, lecture, online lecture, which will be in May. Uh, the date will be confirmed very soon, so you will find all the information on the website. Um, it's a talk which will be given by Rim Alfurjani, specifically on the topic of community uses of the Marcus Aurelius Arch mm -hmm. in Tripoli before and after the Italian conservation. So, so she's Italy. going to explore precisely mm -hmm. yeah. this topic and the perception from the point of view of the Libyan community. So uh, please uh, make a note of this and we'd like to see yeah, many of you attend <laughs> this lecture. And you will find all the details shortly. We are just still finalizing the exact date, but it will be in May, uh, mm -hmm. this May. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. So, well, I'd like to thank you again, Simona, for such an interesting presentation. And I see also from the debate that there was a lot of interest from the audience, which is absolutely fantastic. So that that's really much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you to you.
And just a reminder for those of you who attended who may not be members of Build Nas already, uh, if you're considering becoming a member, you can find all the information on the website as well as the wonderful benefits that you can enjoy if you become a member. And well, thank you in advance for your support. So again, thank you, Simona, for your talk. Thank, thank you, you for being you, with us tonight. Thank you. And see you very soon.